So today is the today is the last lecture. I'm very sad about it. Also because I have to give two lectures the same day. This is the last time, so you are going to be probably a little bit pissed off after that. <laughs> after three hours. Uh, so I decided. So of course, uh, once you are faced with this situation, you think. Uh, so I have to do something so that these people that do not hate accidents and do not hate me after the after the lecture, right? So one of the things <laughs> I want to do is to use some uh, beautiful pictures for you to see, which is a little bit more relaxing than being uh, using all, always the. I'm mean, trying to interpret what I'm doing in the blackboard as uh, something meaningful. So this will be mostly the second part of the lecture in which I'm going to talk uh, to tell you about uh, how we're trying to, to find. Uh, the action experimentally, so it makes more sense to put to draw this uh, to put a lot of uh, uh, pictures and images for that. The first part is going to um, uh, verse on um, on action cosmology, and there I will try to stick. Uh, well, I will stick mostly to, to the blackboard. I don't know whether the the video is recording already. Is it okay? Very good. Uh, so, but uh, before uh, we uh, we move into cosmology, I have to give you a, only a slight, uh, so a couple of slides of, of background, uh, because well, just uh, to wrap up a little bit the, the um, topic of axial couplings. Um, I just, I, I've just tried to summarize, uh, perhaps. Uh, hmm. I uh, just try to summarize in this slide uh, well, what we expect about the axon couplings. So the axon couplings are um, mostly determined, or the, the, the types of axon couplings are mostly determined by the fact that the Pechequin symmetry has to be exact at the classical level. Okay, and exact at the classical level means that, uh, well, since the axon uh, symmetry is just the shift symmetry, the axon has to appear in the Lagrangian. Uh, as, uh, as a derivative, essentially, right? So this is what you have in the in the. Uh, just have a look at the first uh, at the first Lagrangian, which is the Lagrangian uh, uh, above uh, the symmetry breaking of the standard model. Uh, so the action can couple to fermions. Fermions they have to have uh, the, the right, of course, SU2 uh, and uh, hypercharge uh, structure. Um, and uh, you can have flavor changing couplings. Why not? In principle, this depends on the action model. The important thing is that the action actually couples the derivatively. And then you can have uh, anomalies, okay? Uh, which, the mo of course, if you want to have uh, the action solving the strong CP problem, you have to couple to GG tilde, okay, with an anomaly coefficient that we call n. But then you can, uh, the action can also couple to, uh, to the, um, to the, um, to the um, um, weak isospin to the uh, W bosons and to the hypercharge boson, right? Uh, so no problem about this. Those, those uh, anomalous couplings, uh, the last two do not generate a potential for the action, do not, do not spoil the, the action solution. And uh, the only thing that they are going to do is allow the action, re the action particle to interact with W bosons. Now, if we go below the uh, electroweak scale, of course, W bosons and the hypercharge, uh, they, so you can integrate them out. Uh, they disappear from the theory because they are too massive. Also, the Higgs disappears, but I didn't write it here. And uh, only one combination becomes uh, relevant at low energies, which is the photon. And uh, the coupling to photons is no, uh, usually um, condensed in this uh, E parameter that I wrote you for electromagnetic anomaly, essentially, E for electromagnetic. And uh, so the coupling to gluons stays, and the coupling to fermions uh, stays. Um, those uh, at this level, the coupling to fermions is a model-dependent thing. So the only thing that you need for the QCD action to be the QCD action is really n. Okay, the rest is just things that appear in different models. Um, uh, here, just uh, noted a, a, a new change that is just to to remind you what I told you yesterday. That normally, uh, even if the action is defined uh, with respect to some energy con uh, with some energy scale, which I call V a, okay. This, this could be the vacuum expectation value of the field that I showed you yesterday. Normally, at low energies, um, we are not sensitive to this, and then we just really write uh, the energy scale related to the action, so the action decay constant, like the, act, the, the only parameter of the action theory, as Fa, okay? By just uh, reabsorbing the n coefficient into, into B, okay? I would love to have a pointer here. Okay. Um, and therefore, uh, n disappears from the theory, and it appears in, uh, so of course, it gets 
these coefficient, these two coefficients uh, renormalize, and the the um, coefficient that appears multiplying the photon photon tilde. Oh, right. And this coefficient that multiplies um, the coupling of axions to two photons uh, becomes the electromagnetic anomaly divided by n, right? And um, so this is pretty much what uh, the Lagrangian that we have before uh, all the magic of QCD happens. When gluons condense, we can integrate all the um, irrelevant degrees of freedom uh, of quarks and, and gluons. And um, at this level, so this is the exercise that we did uh, the first of the three lectures, essentially. Uh, at this level, the axion that I wrote at, in the higher G theory uh, uh, rotate, so it gets mixed with the pions, right? So this is what I wrote like this. Above this line, the axon is the phi field, but below is really the, the, the axon with, a, with a, an adequate mass. This axon mixes with the pions, and thanks to the mixing to the, uh, with the pions, now the axon is going to couple uh, with the different coefficient to, to fermions. In this case, fermions are electrons and protons and neutrons and so on, right? Because... Uh, well, here above this line, the fermions were quarks and, and leptons. Now the quarks become uh, uh, protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons, they have, coupled, they have coupling to pions, right? So since the axion mixes with pions, uh, here, even if this term was absent in the high energy theory, the, uh, the axion is going to couple to, to protons and neutrons more than independently, okay? Thanks to the mixing that I, that I computed uh, to you. Uh, now the action is getting a potential term from, from, from QCD, okay? So this term, thanks to this term, you generate couplings to protons and neutrons, you generate the potential, and you generate the mixings uh, with the pions that I showed you. And moreover, we also uh, calculated, or I also illustrated how to compute uh, the fact that thanks to this mixing of actions to pions and actions to eta prime, the action ends up having another contribution to the coupling to photons, uh, than the one that we had perhaps in the original theory, right? So this is more or less like a summary. And uh, in general, this is the kind of Lagrangian that you will be facing to try to detect the action and to see their implications. And, uh, okay, this is uh, sometimes, so this is another wrapping up of, of this. Uh, so uh, there's, there are, yeah, this is a dimension, mm, yeah. Normally we don't write or phenomenologists do not write these couplings like this. Uh, the coupling to photons normally is expressed through this F A gamma, which is nothing but just wrapping this thing, this loop factor, uh, and F A into, into one number. The coupling to electrons or the coupling to nucleons normally is uh, processed even more. So just using the equations of motion, this derivative can be applied here, and this gives you uh, essentially a mass of the fermion that can be reabsorbed in this constant and reabsorb this thing, you end up having something like this. At least at low energies, this is, uh, well, no, this is essentially almost equivalent, and we use it for com computing cross-sections. And this defines like a Yukawa coupling, and the Yukawa coupling is nothing but a combination of these things. You can also have the same for uh, flavor-changing um, <laughs> neutral currents. Uh, and uh, of course, the, remember that the, the action is a dynamical realization of uh, theta bar. So whatever we had theta bar in the standard model, now we are going to have the action. And in particular, the action, which I, sorry, it slipped here. So this should be the action divided by FA. It also couples to the electric dipole moment of, of the neutron and, and the proton, right? Since the vacuum expectation value of the action, and here is, I've renormalized with theta bar, sorry. Uh, so the vacuum expectation value of this object is zero. So in the vacuum, the electric dipole moment of the uh, the electric dipole moment of the neutron is zero, right? So this is the solution of the strong CP problem. But if I displace a little bit the axiom from zero, the the electric the, so the neutrons will get an electric dipole moment, which is something that we can search for. Uh, very good. So just a summary of the landscape. Thanks to these couplings, people have uh, dedicated uh, some time to try to find uh, the action. So very soon after it's uh, pro uh, propo uh, be, uh, of it being proposed, uh, there were uh, some uh, experiments search searching for axions related to uh, decay constants which were around the electroweak scale. This is what I told you uh, last time. 
Uh, unfortunately, th those accents, so these searches were just uh, searches for accents in uh, nuclear, reactor, uh, nuclear reactors because accents coupled to protons and neutrons, they can, protons or um, excited nuclear states can relax by emitting axions. Um, and axions in this, uh, in this, of course, if they can be, if nuclear excitations can de de excite emitting axions, you can detect them again, right? You can detect them again. So you can produce them in, in nuclear reactors. And you can just put a detector and try to detect them, right? And people did this. Uh, well, the, the nuclear reactors were not done for axion physics, but uh, they used uh, nuclear reactors to search for these objects, and they didn't find them. So they put some constraints here, uh, up here. And then, um, the, the, so the, I think the, definit uh, the definitive experiment uh, that was uh, really a, a very strong um, uh, hit collision against the accents was a beam dump experiment done in Stanford, which uh, they essentially they dumped electrons against a, a target here. Uh, since, um, well, and uh, in this in this uh, collisions of the electrons with um, with the target tungsten, uh, uh, tungsten, I suppose, one could produce axions, right? So if you have an electron, um, you can radiate an axion if the electron interacts with a, with a, with a nucleon, okay, with a nucleon. You can, an electron can interact, uh, can produce an action through the action uh, electron coupling, but it also can produce, uh, so these electrons can produce photons or gamma rays, okay? So you can radiate a photon to so the electron, can radiate a photon, and this photon can interact with other photons and produce an action, okay? So you have different ways because, I mean, here you have a lot of chunk. So essentially, if the axon has any coupling to anything, you can produce it. So they, they considered that some axons could be produced here, can go through a mountain of 100 meters, and here they could decay into two photons. So just putting another detector here, they could see if uh, axions could be found. So this was making use of the, of the fact that axions couple to two photons, and this is a generic thing that we saw uh, it happens because axons generically mix with pions. Pions decay into two photons, so axons are going to decay into two photons. Uh, so it might be, might happen that this combination is accidentally very close to zero, but one doesn't expect that it will cancel exactly. That, that would be a very fine-tuned cancellation. Sorry? No, 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 this was uh, essentially uh, just a uh, normal decay. Which, is, uh, which was of the right size, so this was another 100 meters, I think, uh, for axions that have a uh, decay constant which is not so, not so large. So axions with a large mass, you see mega uh, electron volt, ki uh, kilo, from kilo to mega electron volt, these decays were, uh, ranges were in the, in the appropriate range. Uh, and actually, what cuts these bounds here is the fact that at very low energy, uh, at very low masses, the decay rate of axons becomes uh, extremely small. Why? Because just by dimensional reasons, the decay, the decay lifetime of an axion, of course, has to be proportional to this coupling constant, right? That I showed you before. And this is nothing but one over FA squared with some coefficients, right? Axons interact with everything always with powers of uh, 1 over FA. In this case, FA squared, so the amplitude is 1 over FA, the, the square is uh, 1 over FA squared, and then to, make, to, to convert this into an energy scale that would give us a rate, there's only one energy scale left, which is the mass of the axion, right? So if you remember that the mass of the axion is inversely proportional to FA, okay, this rate, you will find that it's proportional to MA to the 5. So, of course, uh, when these uh, so accents that have uh, masses of the order of mega electron volt, they have uh, interactions very, very similar to those of, no of normal mesons. They have masses similar to normal mesons and interactions no uh, of the same time. And these decay lifetimes can be 
similar to the decay lifetime of a neutral pion, okay, which is small. But if you go a few orders of magnitude below, this thing decreases immensely, okay, in such a way that these objects, uh, when essentially, when you cross something like 10 electron volts, they have a lifetime which is shorter than the lifetime of, of the longer than the lifetime of the universe. So these uh, objects here, they can they can have long decay lifetimes. And these ones, they can have short decay of lifetimes in terms of the age of the universe. In terms of the, of the size of an experiment, those are the ones, okay? So, yeah, so when, when these accents were excluded, then the next thing to re, uh, was to realize that accents could have an impact, just uh, like uh, neutrinos, on stellar evolution, okay? And uh, this was the, the next uh, thing to do. So very weakly interacting axions uh, that can be produced in the interior of stars. And uh, if they are very weakly interacting, only very few axons will be produced, typically from their core, which is the denser and hotter part of the star. And uh, for instance, well, there, there are different processes which are relevant. In, inside of the sun, uh, you can have the so-called Primakov process that uh, takes a photon and a charged particle, like an electron of the plasma, and uses the coupling to photons, okay, uh, to convert a photon into an axion. Okay, this is the uh, so-called Primakov process. And this, because this, this was used by Henry Primakov to measure uh, through the same process, to measure the lifetime of the pi zero. Okay. So instead, well, he didn't use it in the sun, of course. He used gamma rays to, uh, to produce phi zeros in laboratory experiment. So uh, in the sun, you can, uh, you can see that this, uh, this um, oh, you can compute this rate, and you can compute how many, or how much energy, and this, funnily enough, this is called luminosity, so, but okay. L the luminosity is the energy per unit time that is shine uh, in, in, in the form of axions, uh, can be of the same order than the solar photon luminosity if the coupling J gamma is of the order of 10 to the minus 9 inverse GV. Okay? So if FA is of the order of 10 to the 6, uh, yeah, 10 to the 6, 7 GV. Now, what happens? What happens if the luminosity, yeah, by the way, with this, I, I, I'm giving you this number. Because now you know that the luminosities, so if you are above here, more or less, so the axons interact more strongly with photons, right? So you, you are going to produce more axons. But nevertheless, this cross-section is super small. Uh, so the, the cross-section of producing axons is really very small because it's suppressed by 10 to the, so by an energy scale of 10 to the 6 GeV or something like this, okay? These objects, they are produced very scarcely in the sun, but they escape. And the probability of being reconverted inside of, of the sun is very small. Okay? That's the trick. Uh, and therefore, they just uh, act like an uh, energy sink for, for, uh, for the sun. And this is actually, interestingly, what limits uh, the rate at which a, a hydrogen is converted in helium in stars, is the rate at which we, uh, so the star can get rid of the energy. Okay? So, um, if you, yeah, because when hydrogen is, is fused into helium in, this, in, this, uh, in the center of a star, some uh, energy is produced and some pressure is produced that, that prevents, uh, in a sense, that the star uh, gets more dense and fuses faster hydrogen, right? So this is what happens in the sun, at least. But of course, if you help getting rid of the extra energy by emitting axions, what happens is that the sun can now uh, fuse hydrogen faster. So it will evolve faster to the next stage of uh, stellar evolution, which is, which is uh, helium burning, okay? Uh, so just by measuring or by estimating the lifetime of the sun, one can just put a constraint on the, on the luminosity of axons, okay? Of course, if the luminosity of axons is much smaller than the luminosity of photons, this means that you are not going to change very much the rate at which hydrogen is converted to helium, okay? So there's a natural cutoff. And this that I explained you for the sun can be applied to other stellar systems, okay? The idea is that you compute the luminosity, so the energy loss of the star in axions, and you compare it 
uh, with the typical luminosity, uh, with the typical energy loss of the star. If, if they are comparable, they can affect, uh, so the, the action emission can affect the fundamental, pro the fundamental processes that are cooling the star, okay? Uh, so this has been applied to many things, like uh, the sun, of course, has been applied to red giants, red giant stars, which are gigantic stars uh, that uh, essentially have a, a, helium, a helium core uh, and uh, only produce fusion around this core, helium, uh, hydrogen to helium in this core. And um, they have been used um, to, so in, in this horizontal branch stars, which are the next uh, stage of stellar evolution in which helium is also burning into uh, carbon and oxygen in the center of the star. Uh, they have been used also in, in white dwarfs. White dwarfs are the next stage of this ty type of stars if the star mass is very small, okay? If the mass is very small, uh, there's not enough pressure to burn so to fuse carbon and oxygen, so the star uh, becomes a, a ball of carbon and oxygen that simply cools down. It, it's, it doesn't have enough mass to produce the pressure to fuse carbon and oxygen, and the star becomes dead. Uh, but, uh, so it, and it takes some time to radiate the thermal energy that it had in the beginning, right? So we, we can observe the luminosity of white dwarfs is related somehow to the temperature that is inside, and we can observe how the different white dwarfs around us are cooling and the distribution of the temperatures and we can estimate the luminosity at, at which, also the rate at which they are cooling down. Um, on the other hand, if, the, if the, this is happens typically for stars which are smaller than two solar masses, something like this, well, this, this range is a little bit, well, probably even more. Um, but for masses much, more, much larger than something or of a few solar masses, you can continue um, burning uh, carbon and oxygen and actually all the rest of the elements until you reach iron, iron, uh, and you end up with a star which is like an onion with iron and uh, increasingly lighter elements until uh, hydrogen more or less. Uh, iron is the, is the nucleus with, uh, with the lowest uh, binding energy per, per nucleon. So it's the most uh, essentially way of, uh, or the lowest energy state that you can just have with nucleons without changing baryon, baryon number. And uh, so there is, there, if the star is very massive, or so it is, yeah. And what happens is that at some point, um, the pressure on this nucle uh, of this nuclear is so high that the star can collapse and produce a super, uh, supernova. So collapse, bounce into a neutron star, and explode a supernova or become a black hole. But in this uh, supernova collapse, um, oh well, and producing a, a neutron star, okay? The neutron star, so this supernova can produce a black hole or a neutron star at the end. So again, we can observe how neutron stars cool down and put constraints from neutron stars, but they are, the, the, our data is, the quality of the data is not very good. Um, with black holes, we, we don't know very much. Uh, but actually we had, uh, so there's a very famous bound that has to do with, uh, with supernova, supernova 1987A, because um, the mechanism of, uh, of core collapse before the supernova was a little bit a matter of debate, okay? So the idea is very simple. So when the, when the iron core collapses into a neutron star, uh, there's a huge, so this neutron star has a huge energy. And uh, therm, uh, as a, so all the gravitational energy of this iron core converts essentially into thermal energy. Uh, and the it becomes so dense that even neutrinos uh, uh, are trapped there, so the neutrinos cannot escape the, the star. It's not like in the sun, right? In the sun, neutrinos are produced in the, in the core and they escape, uh, and you can detect them. But in the neutron star, or in this stage of the neutron star, uh, it's so dense that neutrinos are only emitted from the surface. There's you have, the, you have the, the, of course, the rest of the star that is exploding, 
Uh, but nevertheless, so yeah, and uh, it's very interesting that we know very, very much what is the energy that this neutron star has to radiate because this is essentially related with the maximum mass of the iron core. Okay, this is the, which is related with the mass that the core has before collapsing, which is related to the Chandrasekhar limit. So th there's a theoretical bound on the amount of mass that this iron core can have, in a sense, before collapsing. And all this energy is going to uh, convert into thermal energy of the star. And we can more or less estimate what is the time that, that one requires to radiate this energy in neutrinos. OK? I don't give you the numbers because uh, I don't remember them very well myself. The important thing is that if one makes the numbers, one uh, can predict uh, a, ten, a pulse or, or yeah. One can predict that during something like 10 seconds, there will be a burst of neutrinos. And most of, these, most of the energy in, the, uh, in this neutron star, thermal energy will be radiated away in 10 seconds of MEV neutrino emission. And actually, during this, uh, the explosion of supernova 197A in, in the Andromeda galaxy, uh, we were able to detect, with some neutrino detectors, we were able to detect a pulse of neutrinos. And the pulse of neutrinos lasted something like 10 seconds, okay? So this, uh, mo this was the first big success of, uh, of theory of uh, supernova core collapse. Uh, but it, uh, it also gave us an inf the information that there is no other source or there's no, no other source of cooling of this neutron star, at least significant. In other words, it gave us the information that this neutron star cooled down by emitting neutrinos, or mostly neutrinos, and not axions. Okay? In the core, yeah. So, essentially, this uh, argument is what you see more or less here. So, the supernova 97A can be used to rule out essentially these two pieces of, para of parameter space until masses of the axion of 10 to the 8. Because, um, yeah, uh, and thanks to the action coupling to uh, protons and neutrons, okay? It turns out that, yeah, neutron, a proton can interact and radiate an action, and this, would, and this action would escape. And if this happens very fast, uh, we would have seen a much shorter pulse of neutrinos or no pulse at all. These other uh, constraints come from the other arguments that I gave you. And overall, and without entering into, into much complication, they essentially rule out action, uh, action decay constants, which are uh, smaller than 10 to the 8 GeV, more or less. Um, but you see, unfortunately, this is slightly model dependent. Because, so the axions as a, as a solution to the strong super problem are very predictive at, uh, any, at um, well, they have one fundamental parameter, which is FA, but then they have order one parameters, right? These are model-dependent parameters. The, if this is two or this is one, it is going to change by a factor of further one this limit. And um, so you always have to take these numbers with an order one uncertainty, okay? Very good. So this is for later. So let me just uh, now go to, to cosmology. Now I want to know how much time did I invest. Okay. We have one hour for cosmology. Ah, um, oh, by the way, so the cosmology is linked also with uh, this limit here. So there's a limit here that comes from cosmology, uh, but it's also, but it's only thermal cosmology. So in the, in the re remaining part of the lecture, I'm going to tell you how to, what, what are the implications of accents, QCD accents mostly, uh, for cosmology. By the way, um, as you could have guessed, uh, so all these bounds or experiments, they are not only applying to QCD axioms, they apply to any other particle that has, the right, so that has relatively similar masses like the axion and the, and the, and the coupling, and, and some couplings which are comparable, right? For instance, uh, the burst duration of the supernova 1987A would apply essentially to all particles that can be produced in the supernova, so those who have masses below MeV, which is the typical temperature of a supernova, but with cup, uh, that, with, that couple two protons, okay, with a similar coupling to the axion, and so on. Uh, yeah. So the, the the other 
bounds that you have there, they depend on, on particular coupling. So for instance, uh, for white dwarfs, the most important bound uh, is the coupling to, to electrons. Or with globular clusters, you can rule out 10 to the 8 only with the coupling to electrons. With the coupling to photons, uh, you are in the, the 10 to the 10 limit. Or uh, using the sun, you can constrain the, the coupling to photons, but only between, yeah, in this range of axion masses. But this applies to axion-like particles. So particles that have these interactions, but maybe they don't solve the strong CP problem because they don't couple to gluons, okay? Of course, these are theoretical particles that we have never found, but they could be there as well. If there's an axion, why not an axion-like particle? Very good. So cosmology. Um, all of you, 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 all, of, um, all of you have already had uh, a course on cosmology, right? So if I draw the uh, history line of the universe, um, you, can, you can help me putting the landmarks. For instance, as a factor of redshift here, we are now at uh, redshift equal to zero, like the, the universe is dominated, apparently, according to the lambda CDM model by a cosmological constant or something that looks like this. Uh, if we go back only a little time, and for until redshift point something, the universe seems to be uh, dominated oh, dominated by uh, matter, by the dark matter of the universe. And um, at some point, if we go back in time, so at higher redshifts, uh, at some redshift, uh, the universe becomes radiation dominated. Who, who tells me this redshift? More or less. Hmm? Thousands, yeah. Something like uh, at a factor of a thousand, the, actually this is more or less the redshift of the decoupling of the CMB, and matter and radiation domination happens a little bit earlier. Um, and the next uh, landmark in the history of the universe is perhaps uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis that happens uh, at a redshift. Meanwhile, um, this is the temperature of the CMB, of the temperature of the universe. I'm writing here. Temperature of CMB or redshift of, of uh, sorry, BBN, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. Do I hear? Sorry? 3,000 watts? Uh, but what unit? So uh, you're telling me the, the redshift. Uh, 3,000, we are in the epoch of the CMB, yeah? But now if, if I wanted to go back, sorry, I'm, maybe I'm going too fast. Uh, I want to back, go to back to, I want to go back to BBN, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. This is, at the high, this is happening at a high redshift. Uh, at what temperature, more or less? One MeV, you said GeV, but somebody said MeV. Okay, yeah, this is more or less like MeV. And uh, the temperature increases more or less inversely proportional. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is the temperature. Uh, the temperature increases, the redshift also increases by the same factor, more or less. So this would be something like 10 to the 10. Uh, and this is as far as we know the universe, actually, with, cer with a certain certainty. So if we go, however, uh, we know that, uh, or at least we think we, were, we had a, a period of the history of the universe in which the universe was inflating. So we had another period of, of domination of something related like a cosmological constant. Uh, we don't know exactly when this happened. Uh, and uh, at some point, the universe, we can think that uh, reheated, right, and then Perhaps from inflation to BBN, it was all dominated by radiation. So the, the expansion of the universe was dominated by radiation. Radiation was the most abundant substance of the universe. And if this was like this, which is kind of the simplest universe, because we know there was inflation, we know there's radiation domination. So everything that you want to add to this picture is complicating the model, uh, which is perfectly fine, but we have to start with something. Um, so if we assume that, then we know what happens more or less. 
if this was sufficiently, uh, sufficiently high temperature, at some point, uh, at a, uh, the temperature of 100 MeV, there's a QCD phase transition in which, uh, of which uh, protons and neutrons are no longer the relevant degrees of freedom. The really uh, gluons and quarks are the relevant particles in the, in the plasma. And if we go a little bit higher to 100, M, uh, 100 GeV, then we have an electroweak phase transition. Oh, electroweak. Uh, above which the Higgs does not take a vacuum expectation value anymore, although this is hypothetical, this depends on, on the completion of the standard model, or, the, or how do you want to complicate physics beyond the standard model. But in the simplest case, above here, there's uh, the, uh, the symmetry, so the, the electroweak symmetry is, is not uh, spontaneously broken. And uh, above here, we don't, we don't know, because at those temperatures, there might be particles that, uh, that have masses that we have never observed or whatever. But uh, now we are talking about actions and we are talking about a new energy scale. Um, so we are forced to introduce uh, one energy scale, FA, into the game, or VA. And um, therefore, we end up with, and this, sorry, and this energy scale is very large. It has to be larger than 10 to the 8 GeV or so. So it falls, so whatever happens in these, uh, around these scales, it falls into the black ages of the universe, a, a, a region so early that we cannot see, right? And it turns out um, that, of course, so the axion cosmology is therefore uh, cosmological model dependent, but also Axion model dependent, as we will see. So you have a huge freedom to accommodate many things. So uh, I just want to tell you in this lecture, I want to cover essentially the, the most important features, and I hope that your uh, curiosity will just fill the gaps uh, by you asking many questions to get uh, to get out of the of the standard. So essentially, there are. Um, there's one extremely important event in the history of the axion cosmology, which happens when uh, the energy scales of the universe are of the order of the, uh, of the decay constant. Why? Uh, at this time, we expect something like a phase transition. Why? Um, because I, mean, you, you, uh, I think we have already, we have already mentioned that the cup, all the uh, couplings of the axion are dimension five operators, right? So they're effective operators. At some point, they become, um, so the action theory that I've, wrote, I've uh, written down, it becomes non-perturbative, okay? And it actually makes a lot of sense uh, to build a renormalizable theories of the action, okay? In which the action appears below a given energy scale as an effective degree of freedom, okay? Uh, the action, the natural way of introducing the action in physics beyond the standard model is uh, as an effective particle, as, an, uh, as a Goldstone boson, right? That exists only below this energy scale. And this is actually the only example that I've been, uh, that I had time to give you, actually um, had this feature, right? We, uh, we introduced a heavy quark, we introduced a, a new scalar, and this new scalar uh, at some scale takes a vacuum expectation value and then uh, gives a mass to the scalar, gives a mass to the quark, and below those masses, we only have the action. But above those masses, if we hit the universe, uh, of course we produce this Higgs particle and this heavy quark particle. So this would be the, the relevant degrees of freedom and not the action. So we expect that at some point in the history of the universe, there has to be some kind of phase transition. Some, and in this picture that I draw here, there are two particular and very important places or positions where this phase transition can happen. Uh, one is here. Uh, this, normally, this phase transition is called the Pechequin phase transition. Uh, and the other one is here. So this is scenario is called, uh, after inflation, 
for obvious reasons. So a scenario A, mm, let me just call, yeah, Peche Queen, for instance. A scenario A, after inflation, a scenario B, the Peche Queen symmetry becomes spontaneously broken before inflation. And these two things, they can happen in a variety of different ways, but they have, they're going to have a generic package of predictions. All the models that have that share this or this terminology. And so we are going to start from the most difficult uh, in alphabetical order uh, with the scenario A in which the Pechequin symmetry uh, br breaks after inflation, so we don't have to care very much about inflation. So in this scenario, at least in the way I've described it, inflation happens, then reheats the universe and reheats the universe at a temperature which is larger than the uh, Pechequin temperature. So for some time, there is a complicated melange of, of particles in the universe that we don't understand. Then there is a phase transition, and then the action becomes a relevant degree of freedom. And um, so after this uh, phase transition, the action has to take a decision. Let me just look at my notes. I know, I know the decision that it has to take. Um, after the after the Pechequin phase transition, the action has to take a decision, and is uh, or the universe has to take a decision, which is uh, around which value the action field the action field is going to uh, stabilize at a certain part of the universe. And this is because essentially very high temperatures, which are much larger than uh, lambda QCD, the action potential uh, is extremely suppressed. Okay. So the axion is essentially a flat direction. Well, let me just put it like this. So the axion is a flat direction. Uh, this axion is, is the phi A, right? It's a flat direction. This means that the axion potential, or the, yeah, the cost of, of displacing the axion field is essentially zero compared with these temperatures, right? Much more than T, or the axion mass is much smaller than T. And this happens because of two very interesting reasons. The first, first one is the, the, the distribution that I to, uh, gave you already. The temperature is much larger than, than, the, than lambda QCD, so, and the action mass is typically much smaller than lambda QCD, so temperature is much, much larger than the action mass. But there's another complication, is that uh, above the f QCD phase transition, so for temperatures above uh, lambda QCD, the description that we have done of the, of the potential changes slightly, okay? Um, the potential becomes uh, suppressed. Let me just put the potential for the action, the GGT, the potential of the action uh, becomes suppressed, very suppressed, because uh, QCD starts becoming perturbative, okay? And uh, we, I essentially I've told you, the only thing that can give mass to the action is the GG tilde term, right? The GG tilde term uh, is, a top, is a, this topological uh, object that only reads essentially winding numbers of, uh, of, of, of uh, instantons, right? But the only problem is that instantons become extremely rare at, at high temperatures because the, the action of an instanton or the amplitude of an instanton is always essentially proportional, because these are non-perturbative non objects, they are weight, weighted in the path integral by the exponential of the Euclidean action that involves one over the, cup, the, the strong coupling squared plus something, okay? Now, when G becomes very small at high temperatures or high energies, this thing becomes super exponentially suppressed, okay? And uh, so the, the action potential becomes suppressed. It doesn't become exponentially suppressed. It only it becomes a power law suppressed because this thing here, uh, G of T, uh, it has a logarithmic running, right? So at the end, what we get is something like 
uh, that uh, the QCD potential depends with the temperature, in, so it becomes suppressed with high power of the with high power of um, of the temperature, where this beta is related to the beta function of QCD. Okay. Okay, but uh, these are details that do not matter very much for uh, what I want to say. The important thing is that you, you can think that uh, above this, uh, this energy scale, more or less, the action potential is not the one that we draw in static. It becomes to become flatter and flatter, okay? It becomes really flatter and flatter. So now we have two reasons why uh, we can treat the action as a massless particle. And the mass, what is the vacuum expectation of a massless particle? It can be anything, right? There's no reason to choose pi halves or pi fours. So what is going to happen is very interesting. After the phase transition, each causally disconnected part of the universe is going to make its own decision. Okay? So we have uh, a picture which is uh, very badly... <laughs> Uh, written like or, or depicted like this because the action field is going to be continuous okay but uh, but it's going to have um, it's going to have uh, in in a region of the universe that has the typical size of the horizon okay which is the, that is the typical size that the light has to, had time to, to cross uh, in, that, in that region, the action is going to be homogeneous. Let me just go into that now. But, this re but outside of this region, uh, there's no, there, 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 could, there cannot be any information. So there wasn't time enough to transfer information from here to there. Okay? So, yep. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, 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 it has a it has a very small mass. I'm I'm saying that at high temperatures it's even smaller. Okay. Just only that, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is what, yeah. So it's, it's very small compared with the temperature, definitely, and any other scale in the universe. But it's even more suppressed. I'll, I'll draw a diagram later. Uh, so yeah, so we are, uh, we we got something like this, and if you draw this. Uh, so this phase transition becomes a, a sort of a ferromagnetic phase transition, or at least this, this sh should be the picture that you can have in mind, right? Because the action uh, field, uh, if, if it lives in a circle, right, like the, the action field that, uh, of the KSBC model that we saw yesterday, is just an angle field, right? So then uh, each of these domains has to choose a direction. And these directions, of course, they have to be continuous, right? Uh, so the action field, because this is the vacuum, has to be uh, continuous. Uh, but if you go, if you travel, if you look at very large distances, it, it has to be uncorrelated. Um, very good. So this is what happens when you cool down you have a spin crystal, something like this. Uh, you end up having those kind of domains. Uh, but now the action has some par uh, particularity. For that, let me just write the, the equations of motion for the action. Uh, the classical equations of the mo motion for the action are just um, in commoving coordinates and in expanding universe are this. So this is the, this is the derivative of the potential, but at high temperatures, I'm going to neglect this. So the equations of motion for the action field and the perturbations are just uh, like this. Uh, and here, of course, here you have interactions, right? Uh, so let me just uh, neglect the interactions. At very high temperatures, one, um, yeah. Yeah, so let me talk first about the, uh, about the interactions, actually. Um, oh, no. And that's why I wanted to see my notes because otherwise I, but I, I, I went too fast over one. Sorry. So uh, remind me that I tell you about the interactions later. 
So now I'm going to talk about the, the, back, uh, the value of, ac of the action field in the vacuum, okay? The, the really, the, like the zero modes of the action. Then we will talk about thermal modes. And these are the most uh, interesting and relevant. Um, so if th this equation of motion is very simple to, to solve if, uh, if you allow me to just neglect the interactions. But I can uh, definitely uh, neglect the interactions at least, uh, or you can think that I can neglect the interactions if I look at the very large values of FA, right? This is very natural to, to think that at some point interactions, at least with the standard model, they are going to be irrelevant. But there's another extra reason to think uh, that the interactions of very long modes that have the size of the universe or wavelengths of the order of the universe are negligible, and is that uh, all, the, uh, the, uh, all the interactions of the action are of derivative type, okay? Except uh, perhaps the Gigi tilde. So uh, ex except at low energies, actions interact derivatively. And uh, so an action that has an energy or momentum of the order of Hubble it, it will have in interaction rates which are, uh, which are proportional to Hubble. Proportional to Hubble and suppressed, of course, by Fa squared. So, this, uh, so the, the, the vacuum, so the, the longest modes of the action are typically decoupled because the, so, uh, yeah, because this, uh, this fact, let me just call it, so this has a name, I forgot the name. But the idea is very simple. The idea is that all Goldstone bosons uh, at, at zero momentum, they decouple, okay? This has a name, I forgot. Uh, but, but you can see it from here, right? At zero momentum, the derivative of the action is going to be zero. So zero modes, they tend to decouple uh, from, from the rest of the world. Uh, however, they have their own momentum to evolve. And if you look at this equation, it's very simple to, to solve this equation if you neglect the interactions, right? So you can expand the, the action field in modes, in momentum modes, commoving, commoving momentum here, okay? And um, and uh, it's relatively simple to solve the, the evolution of these modes. Um, essentially, it has, they have two moments of time when uh, the driving frequency, so now the, the equation becomes a dot dot plus k squared r squared plus 3h k. equals to zero. By the way, I, nobody has asked me what, uh, Hubble, what, what H is. You all know that it, that's a Hubble constant, right? That was my, my cosmology question at the beginning, was just to make sure that, but of course, if I, if I write something that you don't understand, you have to stop me immediately, because then it becomes worse. So this, after this uh, Fourier decomposition, you get this, and uh, so there are essentially two times in the history of the universe uh, when k divided by r is smaller than h. Then the <coughs> essentially the, the mode is frozen. It's constant. But when, um, when the mode enters into the horizon, right, and this happens later, the action, oh, so the, the solution of this equation essentially is just uh, some constant, one over k divided by r, okay? So there's a, this is a solution that you can, uh, by doing this properly. One over the frequency. Um, this is one over the frequency. Wait, wait. Yeah, one over k divided by r, which is the driving frequency, and then you have um, essentially, I think, one over r here. This you can solve by by the WKB uh, method. Essentially, 
Okay. And then an oscillating feature. Where this uh, phase is the integral of um, k divided by r, delta t. Okay, so this is uh, the approximate WQB um, solution, and this tells you that these modes, essentially, after they enter into the horizon, they start decaying. Um, the exact um, the exact form maybe is irrelevant for what I want to say, but uh, this is something that you have heard many times. If you had a cosmology course. This tells you that when the modes enter into the horizon, when they can start decaying, okay? So the, and these are relativistic modes. They correspond to relativistic particles. The modes are frozen until they, uh, they enter into the horizon and they start decaying. And that's why you see that actually this cor the, the correlation length, so the, the distance at which uh, the, f the, the action field is constant is increasing, okay? Because as we, as, as time passes, the Hubble constant becomes uh, smaller and smaller, the, the horizon grows, and more modes enter into the horizon. And all the modes that ha enter into the horizon, they decay. They take a couple of Hubble times, but they start to decay. So if you look at the universe, you always have this picture in which the correlation length of the action field is of the order of the Hubble constant minus one, okay? And this, is, and this picture uh, is, going to ha is going to apply from the Pacheco phase transition as long as you can neglect the potential, okay? Um, now, we can estimate also what is the typical energy density uh, in, this, in, this, uh, net in this field configuration, okay? The energy density of the, of the accent field is just given by the typical quadratic Lagrangian. Right? Plus the potential here. So that's the energy density, kinetic, gradient energy, and potential, as simple as that, plus interactions, but interactions I'm, I'm neglecting because the action is very weakly coupled. Uh, so now, uh, from here, you can already tell me only from the kinetic term where the action uh, starts to oscillate, it starts, well, uh, when, when the action, when, when a mode enters into the horizon, it decays. Let us forget about these modes. So the modes that are most uh, relevant are the modes that are, uh, that have a momentum, well, let's put it here, a momentum which is essentially a physical momentum, so gradient, this is commoving, divided by R, so this is physical momentum, H, okay? So the energy density is dominated by modes of gradient energy equal to H. Oh, sorry, gradients equal to H. Notation, this was a commoving momentum. So commoving divided by scale factor is physical momentum. That's why I put here the physical momentum H. And, and the kinetic energy is of the same order, right? So this is the typical energy density of this network. And if you remember that in a radi uh, radiation-dominated uh, universe, uh, the Hubble constant uh, is proportional to the energy density of the universe, you get that this thing here is essentially the energy density of the universe, of the radiation, okay, uh, divided by the Planck mass squared. And this is uh, using the Hubble, Hubble law. Uh, multiply by FA squared. So this tells you that the energy in the gradients of the action field uh, follows a scaling solution. That is, that, f that energy follows the, radia the radiation density of the universe, which goes like the temperature to the four, but uh, decreased by a factor FA divided by Planck, which is smaller than one, uh, typically. Okay. Uh, so. In this phase transition, something very interesting happens, which is um, happens in places like this. So whatever you have, uh, this happens in, from time to time, you have uh, a path, or you have a region of space around which if you circle, 
uh, you move in uh, you, you move in accent space from zero to two pi. Okay. And this uh, this is not a domain, but this is just. Uh, Actually, I don't, I don't care about those sounds. I do it the halfway because I, I, so there's always somebody that hates these things. So if I move around this, uh, this circle, uh, in phase space, I turn around the QCD potential. Uh, I, I won't. No, sorry, forget about the QCD potential. In, in, in the axion space, I'm going from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? Um, by continuity, if I shrink the circle, I cannot change this, right? So there, uh, inside of this, any of these circles in which the action goes from 0 to 2 pi, there's at least one point where the action field uh, is not well represented. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's not the correct way of describing the theory. Uh, because the action field, as a phase field, cannot take the values 0 and pi and 2 pi at the same time. So this is a point where the effective field theory breaks down. And this is a point where actually during the phase transition, the field cannot go to the minimum, okay? So this, uh, in two dimensions, in this pic two dimensional picture, this is a point. But if you draw this, in, what happens in three dimensions, what you see is a line, okay? These are the so-called cosmic strings, and uh, they are um, guaranteed to be formed after, phase, uh, after the Pacheco phase transition, okay? Because the accent field is a, is a periodic field. Okay, well, if the accent field is defined as a periodic field, this will happen. Uh, so, yeah. So what happens with these, uh, these strings? Well, you can, you can immediately uh, guess what happens in the in the model that, that I showed you before, right, uh, the, in the KSVC model, um, the accent field was the phase field of, uh, of a complex scalar, right? A complex scalar, so this is real part, this is imaginary part of a complex scalar and has this Mexican hat potential, right? So different uh, values of the accent field are just represented by these uh, lines. Uh, but these uh, arrows, these are the arrows that I draw there. And uh, this, is this is field space and this is configuration space. When I turn around uh, that point, I'm turning around also in field space like this. Uh, so if I want to make sense of this point, essentially uh, here is very clear what can happen. Instead of defining so, yeah. instead of uh, defining the accent field as having all the values from 0 to 2 pi, what I do is just take the raw, the raw field and take it to 0. Okay? So, this is the only way in which a vector, the only, point in which, uh, the only way in which a vector field can have all the angles at the same time is having a modulus equal to 0. Right? So, this is what, uh, what can happen here. But you see, if rho is equal to zero, this means that the symmetry is not spontaneously broken. So the page Aquin symmetry is not spontaneously broken, it's restored. Okay? So cosmic strings are um, these one dimensional lines in which the page Aquin symmetry is not, is not restored and is topologically trapped not to be restored. Okay? By the accident that this, <laughs> that this domain decided to go in, in one direction, this in another, and so on. By this accident, we, end up we ended up having a region of, of the space uh, trapped uh, that cannot go to the real, uh, cannot go to the true minimum. So this means that this object here is going to store a huge amount of energy, right? Because, the, the, for instance, the, the vacuum expectation value of, sorry, uh, the, this potential energy is very large. It's of the order of, of FA. Remember that we draw, or that remember that we we wrote the potential for this S particle is some coefficient times uh, rho or the, yeah, the modulus of S squared minus BA squared. So in, in, the, in this point, the energy density is lambda BA to the 4, which is related to FA, with FA to the 4, okay? 
So the universe, the temperature can be much low, is, is much lower. Now fluctuations have, all, they, they, they live here, around here, right? So there are some thermal fluctuations perhaps. But in these regions, the, uh, the universe is really, uh, sorry, the, the, pot the potential energy is huge. Um, okay, so we can estimate more or less what is the energy density, sorry, oh, the energy per unit length of these strings relatively easily uh, by just taking uh, into account that around, um, around the string, okay, the, the action field A divided by VA in this case is going to be uh, essentially the angle, right? So let me just uh, write it like this. So now this is space, okay? X, Y space, and now we have a string here, and I'm going to define some angle, and I compute a path, and essentially my field configuration uh, is like this, right? So the action field divided by F is equal to uh, to phi. And then the row field is uh, something that uh, at, let me just um, put the origin of coordinates here, <laughs> x, y, okay? Uh, so as a function of the modulus of x, and so rho has to go to zero at the origin, and it has to go at x much, much larger than inverse V is the natural scale. This has to go to uh, VA, okay? The value of the modulus. So essentially, there's a, now you see that there's going to be around this point, there's a region in which the raw field is around to zero and it has large energy. And uh, the size of this region is uh, such that it, uh, it's a compromise between the gradient energy of this object and the potential energy of this object. And we can compute immediately the gradient energy of this object, of the accent field. The gradient energy of the accent field is Fa. Uh, well, sorry. The gradient, the gradient energy of this object is Va times the gradient of, of this, which in cylindrical coordinates uh, is 1 over r, 1 over modulus of x, sorry. So squared, this is squared. And um, now, so you see that this energy, of course, diverges, right? So this is the gradient energy of the action field, and at x equal to 0, this would diverge, right? But the energy density of, uh, is not, of this theory is not the gradient of the action field. The energy density in the full theory is the vacuum expectation, so it's, it's rho, and here rho is the radial field, sorry, or let me just put it like this. The modulus of S squared uh, divided by this, right? Oh. So the fact that S goes to zero at the center uh, is going to uh, regulate this divergence. Very good. So what we can compute is, at least in the one-dimensional approximation, what is the energy per unit length of this string, which is simply integrate this energy density, right, uh, in uh, cylindrical coordinates. And uh, because of the cylindrical coordinates, you get a modulus. Uh, you get, of course, yeah. you get a, a modulus of x, and then you have this x squared. Right, and the rest is uh, a constant, essentially. Uh, well, the modulus of this field, but this is irrelevant, uh, and that's it. So this would be the integral of this. This would be the energy, the energy of the string per unit length, okay? And if you compute this, you get uh, a logarithmically divergent object. So at x very close to zero, this is cut off by the profile of S, so, um, so when X is very close to, so, uh, yeah, sorry. First of all, uh, the natural scale of this is VA, okay, VA squared, but now you have a logarithmic divergence in the, in the 
in the ultraviolet and in the infrared. So the idea is that uh, divergence in the ultraviolet is going to be, in the ultraviolet is going to ca be cut off by the by the profile of rho. And uh, the divergence in the infrared is going to be cut off by the presence of a nearby string. Okay, a nearby string would just have its own uh, distribution of, of phi. And this, uh, we know, we, we can estimate that the next string would be typically at a, at a distance which is related with the Hubble horizon, okay? Because we typically have one string per, per unit Hubble. So this is the energy per unit length. It becomes V squared log. And log of uh, this very large number is another one number. So if we compute um, the density, energy density in this, uh, in the strings, okay, the energy density in the axion, but due to the strings, what we get is essentially something like this. Well, we have to make an assumption, but here's, here, this, this is the physics behind this. Um, at, at, the, uh, at the Pacheguin phase transition, you are going to generate a network of strings just by accident, okay? A topological defects. As the universe evolves, uh, these strings actually, they, they are going to try to tighten, tighten up. They, they, they will tend to minimize their energy, right? And if you have a string which is like this, as long as the universe is big, uh, so the causal part of the universe is, is bigger than the radius of curvature of the string, the string is going to try to straighten up, right? If I'm, I'm fixing the point like here. It's going to try to straighten up. This, now, these strings, uh, they typically form loops or they are in presence of other nearby strings so they can cut and, you know, and, and form smaller loops and these loops, they can collapse uh, to zero, right? And they can collapse to zero by oscillating or just without just oscillating once or whatever. So the, the behavior of the network uh, is relatively complex and is a subject of, of much debate, and I don't want to enter very much into it. But let me just tell you that everyone agrees that there is a sort of scaling solution in which the number of strings uh, per unit, per, per Hubble volume, is of the order of one. Okay? Just because uh, when, when a string is inside of the horizon, it has mechanisms to, di to disappear. Okay? So this means that the density, uh, I'm telling that more or less that you have in a Hubble volume, which has a volume one over Hubble cube, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have typically one string. So the, the energy is pi times BA squared log of something multiplied by the length, but the length is one over B one over Hubble. Um, so the energy density is essentially this VA squared log uh, multiplied by Hubble squared again. So you get that this energy density of the string is of the same order than the gradient energy of the axion uh, the gradient, perhaps we can call it like this, the energy stored in gradients between strings or the axioms that are starting to oscillate, uh, but enhanced perhaps by, by a factor of a log, something like this. So this also follows a scaling solution. So the, the, string, the, string den the energy density in strings, it also is proportional to the density of radiation, only suppressed by Fa squared divided by Blank squared. Uh, yeah, and uh, so what? What is the subject of much uh, much debate in the literature is uh, so when when these strings are collapsing, okay, uh, where does this energy go to, right? And it can only go to uh, axions and gravitational waves essentially. So the production of gravitational waves is not as efficient as the production in axions. So as so this this uh, the energy density of these strings is following this scaling solution, but at, but at the same, uh, same time is producing axions, okay? And um, we can more or less estimate what is the energy that, uh, that is transferred into axions, because it's the energy 
that the, that the network of string is losing to follow this, uh, this uh, scaling solution, right? So, yeah? This? This one? Yeah, so here, the energy per unit length we have computed here, and uh, it is, so it comes, it all comes from uh, the density, so the energy density of, uh, of, the, of the model of S includes the modulus of S squared multiplied by the gradient energy of the phase, right? This thing diverges, but this moderates the divergence, and the vacuum expectation value of this object is V squared. Is B. Yeah, this is energy squared. And there's the length here. Times, yeah. So this, yeah, so this is this equation, sorry. The energy per unit length is V squared. So therefore the energy is V squared multiplied by length and length is one over Hubble. So yeah, so the debate is how efficiently the energy of the strings is converted into axions, okay? Um, but you see that uh, these things are of the same order. Time, oh, gosh. Okay, uh, so what happens now? I think I can make it. So this is what is happening. Uh, from the particular phase transition until uh, the moment in which my assumptions are broken. And the moment in which my assumptions are, uh, assumptions are broken is the moment when uh, I cannot neglect, uh, where is it? I cannot neglect anymore the action mass in the equations of motion of the, of the action and the, uh, the strings. So in this moment, uh, you can define exactly to be Just looking at the equations of motion, okay? The equations of motion were telling me uh, so this this will be the, the divergence of the potential. Uh, let me just simplify this for let me just assume that the potential will be a quadratic potential, okay? So you get uh, this is like the just to, to have something uh, to look at more closely. The, the axion potential is depending, now I told you that this depends on the temperature. Uh, the axion potential dependence on, on the temperature becomes a mass, uh, uh, a dependence on the mass. And, and funnily enough, this thing we can cal calculate. So we cannot calculate the potential because we don't know how instant on, uh, so we don't know how to compute for theta different from zero, but we can compute for theta equals zero, we can compute the second derivative of the potential. Uh, now, when, when we cannot neglect this object, well, essentially when Hubble becomes of the order of the mass. Hubble depends on, on the temperature, and the mass depends on the temperature, so we have to solve this equation, and this will give us a typical temperature that we call sometimes T1. So T1, for the values that I'm, uh, I think are most interesting, uh, which are, oh, we can say even what happens. Uh, so. Um, I can introduce a couple of concepts to see that this T1 doesn't change very much with my assumptions. So Hubble is proportional to T squared divided by the Planck mass, and the action mass is a, a bunch of constants divide, uh, and is suppressed by the temperature. Uh, there, this is some constant, this is some constants, or QCD stuff. Of course it has FA, so the action mass is always inversely proportional to FA. And it turns out that this coefficient is very large. It's of the order of eight. Okay. So therefore, uh, the temperature at which this uh, equation is satisfied is only sensitive to FA, if you can see it. to a very large power, right? So, and it turns out that for values of um, 10 to the 
uh, around 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12, which are going to be the relevant ones in this scenario, uh, for a, a reason that I will tell you now, uh, this temperature turns out to be of a GeV. Okay, so then uh, the magic moment happens around here, just a little bit before, typically, and this is, but this all is model dependent, just before the QCD phase transition that happens at around 100 MeV. Okay, so here we will have T1. So when this happens, now, uh, this picture necessarily breaks down, okay? Because the regions of the universe that are, let me just now measure, so this is equal, this is theta equals to zero, and this is equal, theta equals to pi, okay? Where theta is the action field divided by FA. Uh, so you see, uh, this region will start feeling the potential and will start going to zero, right? And here, it will start going to zero, and so on. This region will go to zero, and so on. But here, around the string, uh, this, this line wants to go to zero. This line wants to go to zero as well. And this line wants to go to zero, but the field has to be continuous, right? So if you redraw this again, If you want to do something like this, you cannot have a string inside, right? So the string was dropping uh, the action field to be between, minus, uh, between zero and two pi. So unless you want to pay a very high price inside of here, what you have to do is at some point, even if in, in a very small region, but you have to complete the circle, okay? So this means that around this string, there's going to be a, a, a region where, uh, and actually it has to be a line in these two dimensions, where uh, theta is equal to pi, okay? And now this, this path that before we were go, uh, doing uh, around, uh, uh, around this Mexican hat, now uh, when the action field becomes, um, Sorry, when, when QCD, the QCD potential becomes relevant, you start, before it was kind of flat, right? We, we thought it was flat, but uh, the action potential is increasing. So you can, you can think that now, in this direction, where th this theta would be, theta zero would be here, and theta pi would be here, now th uh, theta equals pi becomes energetically more, more costly, that's why the field tends to go to zero. But uh, around this, this string, there's always one direction in field space and in position space in which this cannot be done topologically, okay? And um, therefore, what happens is that, uh, well, essentially what is happening is the production of a, of a domain wall, and this domain wall has to end up in another string, okay? That has the same thing. So it, this in two dimensions, uh, when uh, this picture in two dimensions, when we extrapolate to three dimensions, this one-dimensional line becomes a two-dimensional surface. This becomes a, what we call a, a domain wall, okay? And now the picture becomes slightly uh, complicated because drawing in three, three dimensions is uh, it's more complicated, right? But you can see uh, that if, if this would be the whole picture, there would be any problem because uh, here there's a, if I get out of the, of the blackboard, this string uh, has to close there and, and behind the blackboard, form something like a brain, right? So a membrane where the border is just a string, right? Okay. Uh, what happens now is that uh, there's a moment So, uh, in which the, the membranes, so the, the membranes, of course, they want to minimize their energy. Minimize their energy meaning, uh, means uh, shrink to zero, okay? Because they are, the action field feels extremely uncomfortable being at pi, right? It wants to go to zero. But it cannot go, this point cannot go to zero. So the, 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 what happens, in effect, is that the membranes start to push this, push this string. Okay, it has a, a tension, it develops a tension, right? 
uh, to shrink the string. And therefore, it makes the, the, essentially it makes the strings collapse even faster, okay? Uh, particularly because uh, at some point, so the, 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 the string density becomes larger, sorry, the, the, the domain wall density becomes larger than the string density because strings are one-dimensional objects and uh, the domain walls are two-dimensional, okay? So you have one extra power of the Hubble constant, if you want, in your, in your, in your uh, game. To l well, le le let me just trust me on that uh, because... I have to finish at some point. So okay, so the domain walls uh, make the the, uh, the strings collapse very soon after T1, essentially. This, uh, one can define another T2, where essentially all the strings have disappeared. Uh, very good. And then all what is left in this scenario is just uh, the action field oscillating around zero. But what you see also from this uh, scenario is that the initial, ba the, the initial amplitude of the oscillations around zero was different in different patches of the universe, right? So here, this object here started with a relatively small amplitude, but look at this. This guy started with a, more, with a greater amplitude, okay? So the, in this case, uh, the, the action field is oscillating around zero with different amplitudes at the end of, uh, after T2 and so Now, in that case, what is the solution of this equation of motion? So now, the mass has become so large that you can uh, typically neglect uh, Hubble, the, the gradients are, uh, were on the order of Hubble, you can neglect this, and this is also smaller. So in uh, first order, what the action does is just to oscillate around the minimum of the potential. This is what I told you just now, right? So this is time. This time is of the order of 1 over Hubble 1, right? And the action starts to oscillate in uh, one position with one amplitude and other position with a different amplitude, so on. But this is the action field at one position all the position and so on. Uh, so the solution of this equation, uh, even including the, the decay constant, is essentially that the action field is oscillating. Uh, let me just go to Fourier space so I can just write complex numbers. Uh, it also oscillates with a, it's an oscillation with a phase. Uh, instead of the phase being the mass times time, it's just the integral because the mass is changing with, with temperature and time. And here, the amplitude uh, decreases and decreases with the square root of m r cubed, essentially. So this follows from, the, from this, essentially, um, from these three. Okay? And this, again, you can calculate in the way, WKB approximation. Uh, so if you compute the energy density corresponding to this solution, okay, uh, the energy density is inhomogeneous on scales uh, larger than the, than the Hubble 1, the physical Hubble 1. But uh, locally, you can write more or less that this is essentially the action mass, of course, multiplied by, by the action field, uh, of course, plus A dot... The, the, the real formula would be something like this, right? The energy density, but uh, these two things have the same size. So let me just, so that this is the, the relevant size where this is the amplitude, uh, where this is this. And if you plug in all, uh, uh, if you plug in this solution, what you get is essentially the action mass times um, a constant divided by r cubed, okay? So this, this is a, yeah, so if you're interested, I can do this more in detail, but since I don't have a lot of time, let me just tell you that essentially uh, this is, um, so the action becomes, it starts to oscillate as if, I was, uh, as if it was a harmonic oscillator, 
but due to the expansion of the universe, its amplitude decreases in a particular way. And the amplitude decrease essentially leads to an energy density which looks like, essentially, like that of uh, cold dark matter. Okay? Why cold dark matter? Because this is the mass, and this, the amplitude decreases 1 over r cubed. Okay? So this is cold dark matter. So all that is left uh, after the destruction of the domain walls is cold dark matter. And uh, one can immediately compute the amount of energy density today. And one gets that for, so one has to make, of course, since the initial values of the action field were between 0 and 2 pi, uh, the initial value of the action field is of the order of Fa or Va. Uh, and therefore, one can compute the uh, dark matter density as a function of Fa. Uh, the problem is the, the contribution from strings uh, is not so clear, but okay. Normally, one, we, we compute the, com the contribution from the misalignment, and then you, we put the contribution from the energy of strings that has radiated into accents as, a, as an uncertainty. And this turns to be of the, order of the correct value for a value of Fa that is 10 to the 11 GeV. And with this funny uh, dependence of uh, Fa uh, to um, one point something, that comes from the fact uh, that the so this this dependence comes from the fact that depend that uh, the action starts to oscillate later or sooner depending on Fa. Okay. Um, okay. But I wanted to tell you if I have. Well, magically, I still have two minutes. Uh, I, I know I, got, I went too fast here, but uh, l let me just redraw the picture before we do a, a break. Yeah, yeah, so it comes now. Um, so I just uh, made the, the simplest possible case without telling you, with a warning, but uh, it comes now. Um, the complication comes now. But essentially, what I've drawn here is a picture of the action field uh, having really a symmetry in which its vacuum expectation value can be whatever, and then it, it evolves as any other radiation field in the universe, essentially, without interactions. This is completely trivial, except for the complication of the cosmic strings. Uh, and then, suddenly, when the action field re uh, realizes that, it's potential, that it has a potential and it has a minimum of the potential, then all the values of the action field wants to go, want to go to, the, to theta equals zero, uh, which is going to uh, conserve CP at the end, and starts to oscillate around it with dumped harmonic oscillations. So the energy is stored in these oscillations is called dark matter. And, um, and th th I think this is a, a, an amazing and a magical thing that... Um, that an implication of, um, so the, the, the fact that the Pacheguin solution of the strong CP problem is, an, is promoting theta to be dynamical, okay? Uh, and if you now combine this with the fact that Fa has to be very, very large, okay? This means that the action has to be very weakly interacting, and these oscillations are not going to be dumped by interactions. So the, the action co will continue to oscillate, and... Uh, the lifetime of the universe is finite, right? So these oscillations will last until today with a small amplitude. But this means that the, the QCD vacuum nowadays, it has a, something like a theta oscillating in time. And the energy stored in th those oscillations is the dark matter of the universe. So the Pechequin mechanism patched together with a large value of Fa implies the existence of dark matter. It's something that you cannot avoid. It, you, you can change the, the, the value by modifying cosmology or, or the value of the of FA. But you cannot change this logical implication. Okay? If the action exists, some part of the act of the dark matter of the universe will be in form of, of accents. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, so I draw here the simplest 
Fortunately, or unfortunately, well, fortunately, uh, I, I, I didn't want to complicate too much the, much the picture uh, to start with, but I draw here uh, the case n equals 1. You remember that uh, I told you yesterday that the action field can be defined 0 to pi. Uh, sorry, the, the fundamental field, which is action divided by b, can be defi is defined in 0 to 2 pi. But the action field can be defined in 0 to pi n. And what, what this means is that when the action field turns around in this potential, it turns around in the QCD potential n times. Okay? So the picture is more complicated than this because you can have one, max, uh, sorry, one zero here, then one maximum at pi halves, then go to zero here, and then have another maximum, right? So now, what you get is a slightly modified picture. First of all, you don't have one vacuum. You don't have one vacuum, you have two. So uh, this corresponds to zero, this corresponds to theta zero, and this is theta equal to pi. Although a divided by VA is, is only pi, right? Theta equals to pi. So this means that some parts of the universe they are going to start oscillating around, uh, let me uh, now call <laughs> um, theta a, uh, a divided by va, okay? So some parts of the universe will uh, start oscillating ar around here, and some other parts of the universe will start oscillating around there. And in between these regions, there is a domain wall, okay? And you see that cosmic strings here, they attach to not one, but two domain walls. One domain wall is at pi halves uh, of theta, and the other one is at minus pi, minus pi halves, right? So the universe becomes separated in domains, okay? And each of these domains has the same energy density, okay? So this is a completely different scenario to the one I drew before, because now these objects here, they can... Um, they can shrink, of course. You can imagine that they can shrink, right? But uh, there's no preference for, N, uh, for the zero scenario or the two pi scenario, right? So this tells you that uh, even the domain walls become super tense and they are destroying. So once, once the, the balls enter into the horizon, they can, balls are just uh, domain walls, right? Closed domain walls, then enter into the horizon and they disappear instantaneously. But they are always bigger domain walls and bigger domain walls which are larger than the horizon. So what you get is uh, that uh, QCD cannot completely destroy all the domain walls, and there's a still a scaling solution, okay, in which you have always one domain wall in per Hubble, per Hubble universe, but these domain walls, they have a huge energy, okay? No, it's not, it's not a scaling solution. It, that, the energy density does not scale like radiation. It scales uh, with a higher power of the scale factor with smaller scale, uh, power of scale factor. So this means that those domain walls will dominate the universe, energy density. And this is something that uh, we know it doesn't happen, right? We draw this very nice picture, and uh, there's, uh, at no point there's a domain wall uh, domination, okay? And there's no way this thing can stop in principle. So n, n larger than 1 is completely uh, ruled out, my time is over, so I just steal a bit of the next lecture to complete this story, right? So, yeah, now you go to the, to the break with a problem in your head. Thank you. <laughs>